invite you to open your Bibles, please, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to be finishing the chapter this morning, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And uh, we wrap up with Paul's prayer out of this passage. How many of you ever saw the movie, the movie Saving Private Ryan? See that movie? Yeah, okay. Would you believe, would you say it's action-packed? Yeah. Would you say it's rather emotional? Yeah. I think it was a rather emotional, action-packed movie, and and uh, I think of uh, Captain Miller's words at at the uh, as he's dying there on the bridge, and he and he speaks to Ryan and he says, "Earn this, earn it." He was of course referring to the message. He was referring to the sac or the mission, excuse me, and the sacrifice where uh, you know to get this young man home safely to his to his family. And then do you remember at the end of the movie? And I'm not sure that you know, but it was at the end of the movie where Ryan, as an older man, there standing at the grave of of uh, Miller. And he makes, he makes some statement like this. He said, every day I think about what you said to me that day on the bridge. And I've tried to live my life the best I could. I hope that it was enough. I hope that at least in your eyes I've earned what all, you, what all of you have done for me. I don't know. When you heard those words, if you watched the movie... Did you think it was enough? I don't know. Did you? I was kind of left kind of kind of flat in some ways. I know what he was saying, and I know he was saying, uh, you know, I hope I've earned it. But it's kind of interesting, isn't it? I think he was. I think he was saying that. I hope my, you know, and as I think about worth and value, I think about. Maybe, maybe money. I mean, money wasn't really the story there. But I want, to, want you to think about this idea of worth and value. Was his life valued enough or valuable enough for the, for the deaths of those that sacrificed for him? And then, you, you know, one of the things I did like about it is when he said that he, it affected his whole life. And I presume that would be true, that it affected his whole life. When he said every day, Every day. Now, let's flip that over and let me challenge you with a thought. How much does the death of our Savior affect you? I think that's a potent question in light of even, you know, that movie. I mean, shouldn't it, shouldn't the death of Christ impact us as much as, you know, that fictitious movie? It was based on some truth, but uh, yeah. But shouldn't it affect us that much? You know, and only you can a- answer how much the death of Christ affects you on a daily basis. And maybe I, I, I was thinking in terms of the gospel, I'm thinking, wow, do we really understand the gospel if we're not affected by it on a daily basis? You know, when I think about Miller, Captain Miller and the other guys there, they, they were risking their lives. They didn't know how it was going to end. Then I think of Christ purposely, purposefully stepping out of the glories of heaven to die the criminal death that you and I deserved. Wow. Are we worth it? You know, a dollar doesn't even, doesn't even start, does it? But that idea of that idea of value. Well, according to Romans chapter 5 and verses 6 through 10, none of us are worth it because really, apart from Christ, we're ungodly. Apart from Christ, we were his enemies. Apart from Christ, we were sinners. And yet God loved us enough and demonstrated that love in such a way that he sent his son purposefully to die on that cross to save us. So our salvation is not in what we do in any shape or form and how we try to earn it. It is in the super sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. 
It is by grace, through faith. It is not of works. Otherwise, we would say, all the glory really would go to us. We'd say, yeah, I, I earned it. And sad to say, when we look at religion around us today, uh, that's all religion really says. Well, you better pay your dues. You better do your thing. You realize that? That's really what religion, that's all it can offer. It's all it can offer is just kind of a, kind of a sense of earning it for whatever reason. And I was struck with that, and I don't remember where I heard it on a radio, on a, on a reading something on the internet even or something, but I, I ran across this, this idea that, that there is a Fatima in Portugal that is known and famous and worldwide, I guess, but in particular, it appeals to women who literally crawl on their hands and knees and they they actually pray to this to this and kind of and even the some of the Roman Catholic priests they were saying you're doing the wrong thing you're praying to Mary but that was kind of that's kind of the idea and it has a connection with it has a connection with uh, with infants and women and, or children and women and that's what's the appeal to women but they crawl on their knees to somehow earn it to somehow think they earn some connection with God. It's said that when Martin Luther was climbing Pilate's stair in Rome, and uh, that's a story in itself, how Pilate's stair got there, but anyway, he was on his knees climbing that stair when the reality of the gospel struck him. The reality of Romans 117 hit him that says, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And he got up from his knees from his works and trusted the Lord, believed the gospel, became the reformer that we recognize him for. You know, God saves us by his grace. We are, and that really, even grace represents our unworthiness, doesn't it? I mean, none of us can come and say, yeah, I want to buy a little grace. Huh. We can't afford it. We couldn't afford it. It's the gift of God, and it's by faith. And that challenges us then what are you going to do because you have that? That's why I brought up this idea. What are you going to do because you have this salvation that you couldn't earn? How are you going to respond to that? We don't serve to be saved. Otherwise, it would glorify us. We serve because we are saved. And that glorifies God. That's what glorifies God. We don't want to mix up the two like religion always does. And in my mind, I think of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, where I'm just going to encapsulate it, but it, it basically says, the love of God grips us. The love of God grips us so that we live for him who died for us. I hope that's true of you today, because as Paul prays here in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, as he prays here, his focus is, is I think, giving us, giving us an encouragement by telling us what he prays for. You know, if, if all we were doing is just reading through here and say, yeah, Paul prayed for us. And we could, we could zip over this passage, and probably that's what a lot of times we do when we're reading the Scripture. Oh, yeah, here's Paul's prayer, and here's what he... No, I think Paul's praying here because he wants, to, he wants to reach out. He wants to encourage, even through the content of this prayer, he wants to encourage us in these things. He's not just, he's not, just not giving some nice-sounding words. He wants, us to, he wants us to respond in light of that prayer. He wants these things to be true in our lives. And so I want, to, I, want you to take, I want to take you back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to go back to verse 3. Because really here's where the prayer begins. Verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brother, as it is fit and fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Now notice, there's that thankful idea. He says, this is why I'm thankful for you. Your faith shows through. Your, the way that you live shows through. 
and you, as you face all these tribulations. But then he kind of gets sidetracked a little bit. And it's almost like verses 5 to 10 are not really part of the prayer. He's just explaining himself. And so we, that's why we spent, we spent two Sundays on this. Two messages on verses 5 to 10 to kind of, kind of clarify some of these future events and that kind of thing. We're going to get more future events in the next, uh, next week. But pick up in verse 5 with me. This, these persecutions, etc. Verse 5. Which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer since it is a righteous thing with God to repay tribulation those who trouble you and to and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire well what a description isn't it in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified with his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. So he has that intermission in the prayer that discussion in the middle of his prayer that he goes on. Therefore, verse 11, we also pray always for you that our Lord would count you worthy of this calling. Worthy? Worthy of his calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and work of faith with power that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as we look at verse, as we look at this context, uh, I can't help but thinking about this prayer, I can't help but jump back to verses three and four and see what Paul does. Thanksgiving. He, he begins with the idea of thanksgiving to the Lord. Then he interrupted it with that, that, uh, that, that discussion that we've had for the last couple of weeks about end times, about judgment, and that kind of a thing. And, but in that, there's an assurance for believers. There's an assurance for believers that, we, that God is going to make things right, that what we suffer now, God is going to make right with all those troublemakers. There, judgment, there is a judgment to come. And so as we get to the prayer, the, the prayer that we find in verses 11, we see it's kind of a natural continuation. There's still thanksgiving in Paul's mind for how they, how they endured in trouble, but then he, then he launches in verse 11, point B in your outline, pray. And these first few, these first few words in verse 11 uh, really tie us to that context. He has that judgment in mind when he says, unto this we pray. The New American Standard goes, unto this end we pray. And it just ties us right back to the context. And uh, take note of how Paul is also, also says he's praying continually or, or unceasingly. He's following his own pattern that he established in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, to pray continually. He's, he's practicing what he preaches. But then we find, well, what is he praying for? And I think this is where it really gets to, the, gets to the point of the challenge that's here for us, that we could draw a challenge out of this prayer. And he has three main requests, or at least I've broken them down into three parts. Number one is the idea of worthy, that God would count you worthy. Notice how that verse 11, that, God, that our God would count you worthy of this calling that God would count you worthy of this calling in the sense of, the sense of worthiness. And, and uh, to me, it's just kind of a standout thought. That's why I put it in the, in the title. But the sense of worthiness. Yes, it has the sense of value, but of course we know when we're talking in the spiritual realm, it goes way beyond of any human worthiness. But, I, but think of the idea of worth. Think of the idea of value. And so he's challenging these believers, even in this prayer, that, that God would be able to count you worthy. Well, when is he going to do that? I think it has to be a view to the future. He has to be looking uh, somewhat to the future, that the, there's going to be, God is going to at some time count you worthy. Now, 
We are to be worthy today, but I think there's a, a look here in the context, a hint to the idea of the future. And, uh, and, and, but when, we, when I say this call here, by the way, that he says this context of this call, yes, he has the future in mind, but I don't want to give the impression, and I think sometimes we do this, I don't want to give the impression that there's all sorts of calls throughout the scripture. I don't think that's, I don't think that fits the pattern of scripture. I think the pattern of scripture is that it all goes back to the call. It all goes back to one call. The call which ties back into salvation. If you think about Romans chapter 8, 28 to 30, he uses call in the middle of a con context there. And he, and he says that everyone that is justified, now we would say, hey, if, you, if you're justified, you're saved. If you're justified, you've been declared right in God's sight. Justified by faith, Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 says. And so if we go back to that, go back to that call, he says you're called, you're justified, you're glorified. And I'm not going to get wrapped up in all of it, but I think... I think that's where we have to go back. When, when God is speaking about a call, he, that is the foundational type call. That is the call. And then from that, several, several aspects come out in our daily walk. In other words, because, and, and I think what he's saying in this context, because of that call, then there ought to be some action that follows out, follows it. And one of the things you see in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, we are called according to his purpose. In other words, there's a purpose and a plan and a design for God's call. And that affects purposeful service today. It, it affects purp a purposeful destination for eternity. So it's just a natural outflow of, of God calling is that there is a purpose. He saved us for a purpose. He saved us for his glory. And so what, what we have here then is Paul thinking about that call and he says, now, are you going to be worthy of that? Can God count you worthy of that? See, God called you. God saved you. God, God is going to glorify you. Are you... Are you going to live up to that. I, I, I want to be careful. I want to be careful about earning it. But in a sense, he's talking about, about valuing that. And so he's looking to the future, and that's why I brought this chart back from last week. I think what the apostle is doing is he is pointing to the judgment seat of Christ. And we did not put this on our chart. If you weren't here last week, each of these circles represents significant seven future events. And I mentioned when we talked about the rapture, which is this one, that uh, just kind of in conjunction with the rapture, there is a judgment for grace believers. There is a judgment for people who lived in the dispensation of grace. And I think that's what Paul is saying when, he's, when he, is, he is emphasizing being worthy here of God's, of God's call. I think his focus is on Someday you're going to give an account. Someday you're going to stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ. Dale did a great job in pointing us to this in Sunday school this morning. But the idea of the judgment seat of Christ is the judgment. And notice my note, note here. Everyone at the judgment seat of Christ is saved. There isn't a judgment in the future where God says, Oh, you go to heaven and you go to hell. There isn't that kind of a judgment. There isn't a one-time big ball of wax judgment. Judgments are distinct and separate. We noted last week the great white throne judgment at the end of the kingdom. And interestingly, at that judgment, everyone there is condemned and sent to the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20. 1 Corinthians 3 makes a good one for the judgment seat of Christ. Everyone there is saved. Everyone here is condemned. Now, there's some other judgments and things like that, but uh, if you want to fill this out, let me just run through. This is the rapture. This is speaking about the tribulation. This X represents the great tribulation or the abomination of desolation. This represents the coming of the Lord uh, in the, to the earth. This represents, this X is Armageddon, when the Lord will destroy those that come against him. Uh, 
This represents the kingdom and then the great white throne. Those are those seven key events that we brought out last week. There may be a, a folder or two around that has that on it from last week. But, so as we look at the idea of being worthy, said Paul is praying. He's praying for these believers. He's praying that they might be worthy of this call. Of God's call upon their life. And, and he is thinking in terms of them standing before the judgment seat of Christ. By the way, next week we will have, we'll have this chart again. We'll probably have a little more detail uh, as we look at chapter 2 of this passage. So the point is, though, that God calls us and he's going to judge our actions by whether or not they're worthy of that call. He is going to do that. And so the challenge is live up to the call. That's what his prayer, Paul's, Paul's praying for these believers that they would live up to the call of God upon their lives. The second request is that they would fulfill, and this fulfilling has two points to it, but the sense of fulfilling is that, is that God might do something. See, he's praying to God in both of these things, that God would count them worthy, that God would fulfill or complete or finish. I think of, uh, I think that Philippians 1, 6, that God will finish what he started, that idea. Or there's other places that God is going to, go, God is working in us. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, Epaphras prayed for the Colossian believers. And he prayed for them that they would stand perfect and complete. It's the word complete there. In all the will of God. That was his prayer. So it's a very similar type idea. That idea of being filled, being complete, having the work finished in you. And I think when he's sharing this, he's also... He's also kind of hinting to these believers, you know, if you're going to really be what God wants to be, if God is going to fulfill all his good pleasure in you, there has to be a sense of submission on your part. If God is going to actually accomplish what he wants to do in you, if he's going to accomplish what he called you for, there needs to be that sense of submission in your heart and your attitude. I think it's very similar to Romans 12, 1 and 2. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. That has to, that has to take place. Or Ephesians 5, 18. That command to be filled with the Spirit. That sense of being controlled by Him. As you're controlled by Him, you will fulfill all every good pleasure of goodness and work of faith and power. Notice... Point number one there under that is that every good pleasure of goodness. You know, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, it's part of God's plan. It's part of God's plan that good works come out of the life of the believer. It's just part of the design that he made. And I, I see that in the sense of every good, pla every good plan. If you, if you read Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 closely, you see that these good works are already prearranged. God already has a plan. And I think that's the sense. He called you to accomplish that plan. Prearranged, prearranged good works that are there for you to do. How are you going to be, how are you going to be following that plan? How are you going to make sure that you're doing those things? It has to go back to that sense of submission to Him. Lord, fill me with your spirit. I'll allow, you to, I'll allow you to work in me, in and through me, to accomplish these things. And then he, he is pleased with those things. He calls it a work of faith. You know, these things really go together, but that there's really a dependence on God's power in these things. That work of faith in power. You know, in order to, in order to submit your life to the Lord, there, it has to come back. It's a matter of faith. It's a matter of trusting Him. We say we trust Him for our salvation, but when it comes to our daily walk, our daily lives, well, I'd like to take the wheel for a while, right? I'd like to, you know, I, I got these good ideas. You know, none of our ideas really stack. None of our ideas are worth much. It comes back to God doing His work in us. I, uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12 says, work out your salvation. 
let it work out of you. You've got to have it in in order for it to be worked out. And it comes by faith, and it's lived out by faith. Um, I, give, I give you a quote, quote there by uh, Ben Bird Jr., and I, I have a little more of it here. I'll read it to you. Any work that does not have its origin is in faith is of the flesh. So he starts with the negative there. Any work that's not of faith is in the flesh. I think of Romans chapter 14, 13, that says, or 23, that says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Wow. I think sometimes, sometimes even good intentions that are not of faith fall into this category. And of course we know, Romans 8, 8, the flesh can never, ever please God. That's why religion is futile. Because it depends upon the flesh and our own efforts. And so the bottom line, uh, and we have the rest of that quote, he says, remember that it is only as God works through the believer that the works are effective and acknowledged by him. As Dale described the great white throne, or I mean, excuse me, the judgment seat of Christ this morning, he talked about the difference between gold and silver and precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. Has the fire tried our works in the future? The fire's gonna burn it. We know what's gonna burn. The wood, hay, and stubble are just gonna be, the ashes are gonna be gone. All that's gonna remain are that with the, the, the gold, silver, and precious stones. And the sense in the context here, in the, sex of, the sense of this quote here, as God works through the believer, these works are effective and acknowledged by him. Is God going to acknowledge wood, hay, and stubble? Of course not. Is God going to acknowledge things that are not of faith? Of course not. If it's our effort, or if it's, if it are, if it's our doing, they're not going to be effective, nor are they going to be acknowledged by him. It's a matter of a walk by faith in his power. That's what is going to give him good pleasure. That is what is going to demonstrate that you're filled with him answering this, this request. And then he moves on to the third request in verse 12. And I'll read it again here. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that the name of the Lord be glorified in you. Notice that little play in words. Him in you and you in him. Notice that little play on words there. I guess what I want to be careful though is I want to I emphasize that this is not just fancy talk. It's not just nice sounding words. You and him and him and you and, and we don't know which is in where and what. You know, I, it's, it's not just fancy talk. It's not just something nice to say in a prayer. When he talks about this is really the reason for the prayer that God would get the glory. That God would get the glory through him in us. The reality is that Christ has to live in and through us in order for the glory to go to God. Let me just share a couple examples of this out of the scripture. We touched on one of these on Wednesday night as we were going through the book of Acts. In, uh, in Acts chapter 4 and verse 13, the Jewish leaders were amazed. They were amazed that these, these unlearned and uneducated men could do what they could do. They were so bold. Why? Because... They had been with Jesus. Him working within them. That's what they recognized. They recognized that Jesus had a hold of these people. That Jesus was making an impact on their lives. That kind of day to day, day by day thing. He was glorified in them. As you, uh, in, in Romans chapter 15, he talks about the unity among the God's people glorifies him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he talks about morality. You know, everything I read lately is that Christian morality is slipping. That morality among Christians is just, it's just going the way of the world. 
that there's not a lot of not a lot of difference between how a Christian lives morally and how a non-believer lives morally. But at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20 says, your morality makes a difference. It glorifies God. If you realize that, that you're bought with a price, and it says your body and your spirit, magnified, glorified, if you realize you've been bought with, his, with the price, the precious blood of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul challenges the Corinthians that they could glorify God in eating and drinking and whatever they did. If they had that spiritual concern like Paul had for those around them. You know, I, I think that's something that's slipping in our, you know, in our Christianity today too, is the realization that we have, an, we have an obligation to share Christ with our neighbors, with those around us, that we have that opportunity to speak for Christ, to share the gospel. I'm glad we have that opportunity with Vacation Bible School, with the fair, with the Mum Festival and things coming up, that we have that opportunity to, to proclaim Christ. But the verse that really sticks with me and you know, I, I just keep coming back to is 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 10 and 11. It says that we allow the life of Jesus to be seen in us. I think that's what the disciples were doing. That the life of Jesus was seen in them. And as he tells the Corinthians there, even if it's a difficult time, you have that opportunity to let the life of Jesus literally be seen in us. And that glorifies God. In other words, we can glorify God now. We can glorify Him now by allowing Him to live in and through us. And then that next phrase, you in Him. And I think there's different opinions on that, but I see this as emphasizing our future hope when we will be glorified together with Him. And there are several verses I just gave you, Romans 8, 17, that sense that we are joint heirs and will be glorified together with Him. That's part of our future hope. And it's all by God's grace. It's all by the grace of the Father, by the grace of the Son. We can glorify Him by His grace. We can demonstrate that by, by faith in His power. We can live worthy in his enabling. And so as Paul prayed for these believers, I think as they would read these words, they'd say, wow, if that's what Paul's praying for me, if that's Paul's real prayer for me, I, I, could, I could see it being a challenge. How am I doing in this regard? Am I allowing God to work through me like I ought and I think we can, by His power, live worthy. Say, so it's not by our stuff. It's by Him working in us. And He gives us the power to live worthy. And I think this is so much greater than Private Ryan's wishful hope there as he stood there by the, by the grave of Captain Miller. He was, I wonder if my life is enough. I don't think we have to have that, that confusion in our, eye, in our minds. As we're walking with the Lord day by day, we can be confident that we are where God wants us to be. We can have a confidence that we are where God wants us to be and let Him lead us, lead us step by step, day by day. Let Him use us. So I come back to kind of the first the first question that I laid out to you about, about our response to Christ. Stop and think about God's gracious gift of His Son. His purposeful call. It demonstrates that He values us. Do you realize that? It demonstrates that He values us. The challenge is, do we value Him and that call worthy enough, or enough to live worthy of it on a daily basis. Orion said, yeah, I think about it every day. 
Do you turn to your Lord on a daily basis? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this prayer. I thank you for, for the challenge it leaves in our hearts. Father, we thank you for the enabling and the power that you give us as we trust you in our day-by-day -day walk. And I thank you, Father, that that comes to those who are trusting you and for salvation. And I just pray, Father, that you would allow us to take something home out of this that would be practical in our everyday lives, that we might, we might remind ourselves that when we wake up in the morning, Lord, this is your day. May you be glorified in it in me. In Christ's name, amen.